Hello everyone and welcome to the American Civil War and UK History Channel on YouTube. Also, we have a Facebook page, Instagram page, and most of the videos are available as podcasts. Please find the links below. Joining me once again today, I'm pleased to say, is Sarah K. Bierley. Sarah is a historian and author of Call Out the Cadets, Battle of Newmarket, May 15th, 1864 which is part of the Emerging Civil War series. Thanks for joining me again, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me back on the channel. It's nice to see you again on Zoom. We are here to discuss the famous cadets of VMI and their involvement in the Battle of Newmarket. So, Virginia Military Institute, please tell us a little bit about that, please. Absolutely. So Virginia Military Institute was established in 1839, and it started off, they wanted a military protection around the arms um, or military arsenal, which was for the militia in that area of the state. Um, and then they came up with the bright idea of, well, let's have a state military academy, and we will educate the leaders for the future. And they were particularly interested in the concept of citizen soldier. So educating young men in, the, in military training, as well as a solid academic base, so that they could be leaders in their local communities when they finished their time at school. And many of these young men would go on and um, be officers in the local militia units. And then as the American Civil War begins in the 1860s, you see them coming into leadership in the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia as well. Okay, so um, how old are these boys when they uh, come into the service first time? Right. So it's actually a varying age range. And for the cadets that we're talking about, Civil War era, the Battle of Newmarket, the Battle of Newmarket, the Corps of Cadets has young men from ages 15 to about 25. So a very wide range of students at this military academy. Okay. So by the time they're 25, they're not really sort of, uh, sort of more adults, really, aren't they? Right. One of the things that I've noticed in some of my research is you'll often find families in the Civil War era sending sons to VMI to try to keep them out of the Confederate units or to keep them from getting drafted. I've also seen a trend that there's a lot of um, second or third sons. And oftentimes it seems like these boys are getting sent to military school after an older brother is killed in the Civil War. So you have families trying to protect these younger sons, trying to make sure that there are boys to carry on the family name after the Civil War ends. So VMI can be seen as a place of safety. The cadets knew that. There are frequent letters sent home to parents um, describing the Institute as a prison and constantly begging for permission to leave school and enlist in Confederate regiments. Okay, I've never heard that perspective before. That's interesting. Um, okay, so um, apart from obviously learning to be a soldier, what else do they learn while they're there? Right, so there was actually an academic course that they went through as well. So they're learning uh, mathematics, uh, natural philosophy, which is going to be types of sciences, um, things like that, along with military training, so drill, artillery, things like that. Um, the famous Confederate General Thomas J. Jackson, or better known by his nickname Stonewall, he was actually a professor at Virginia Military Institute in the 10 years prior to the start of the Civil War. He taught um, natural sciences, or natural philosophy, and artillery. He was not a popular instructor, we should say, though. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how long does it actually take them to graduate when they actually first get there? So from the moment they get into the Institute, how long does it normally take a cadet to uh, move on? Right, so talking about the era of the Civil War years, um, the typical course is supposed to be four years. But you have a lot of things happening in local communities and nationally. So sometimes you have cadets in and out, in and out. Um, at that time, there wasn't a specific starting period. It was more of when the superintendent sent the letter to your parents and said that you were accepted. So you actually have some cadets who will fight at the Battle of Newmarket who had only been at VMI for a couple of weeks. 
and then you have some who've been there four years. Um, so typically it would be a four year course of instruction, but of course the Civil War makes that challenging. Now Virginia Military Institute still exists as a military school to this day, and now it operates a little bit more like a traditional college here in the United States with a four-year course of study, and now they have a regular start date and a regular graduation date. Okay, so um, can I just ask, was there any threat to VMI during the Civil War, and if so, was there some kind of defensive plan put in place to protect VMI? Right, so Virginia Military Institute is going to play a significant role early in the Civil War, and then its story will continue un to unfold as the four years go on. So to start off, in 1861, Jackson takes the senior class of cadets who become drill masters for this forming Confederate Army in Virginia. Um, then as the war goes on, it takes a while for Union forces to get this far into the Shenandoah Valley. So Virginia Military Institute is in Lexington, which sits at the very southern end of the valley. So it takes a while for a Union threat to get down there. Now in the winter, December-ish of 1863, there are some Union cavalry raids that come into that area and the cadets will leave the barracks of the Institute and they go on this lengthy march. They never actually clash with the Union cavalry, um, but there is some form of defense. It's not a bunch of earthworks or things like that, but it was more of this idea of um, using Confederate units, Home Guard and the cadets themselves to try to keep Union troops away from the area. Now in June of 1864, so just a few weeks after the Battle of New Market happens, the Union Army actually gets up to Lexington and in retaliation for the cadets role in the battle, which I don't wanna spoil it too much, we're getting there. Um, the Union commander, David Hunter, burns the school, burns the barracks. Um, which forces the cadets who are still with the Institute, they're gonna transfer temporarily to Richmond and continue their studies in a building there. Okay. So after the war, BMI is able to rebuild um, on the same area, same location, and they have continued as a school until this day. Okay. Cool. Anyway, so famous painting. So this is a famous painting in uh, BMI, isn't it? So whereabouts is this located? Yes, so the painting that's in the middle of the screen is located in Jackson Memorial Hall, which is on Virginia Military Institute's campus. Um, if you're in the area right now, and we're recording this in 2021, the building's still closed due to COVID restrictions, but hopefully once that lifts, you'll be able to go back in and see this large painting which artistically depicts the VMI cadets charge at the Battle of Newmarket, and it was done by Benjamin Kleindunst. Okay, and the uniform. So we've got a great picture of the uniform inside the museum, I take it. Um, so tell us a little bit about the, uh, the uniform, please. Of course, so the uniform that's on display there, hopefully you guys are seeing it on the left side of the screen as well. Um, that's on display at the Virginia Museum of the Civil War, which is located at Newmarket Battlefield and operated by Virginia Military Institute. Um, so this uniform was worn by a cadet who was present at the time of the battle. So you can see, or perhaps you're not seeing it if you're just listening to our audio, but it's gray woolen pants, a gray jacket, which is short ending at the waist, so almost shell jacket style. Um, I think it's got five buttons down the front, if I'm seeing that correctly long sleeve, so kind of a typical um, uniform. And these are gonna be made from supplies that are probably coming in via blockade runner. We know that VMI had uh, made some contracts with blockade runners to bring supplies from Europe at that time. Um, cadets are going to be paying for a lot of their uniform needs and the collection of letters by Jack Stannard to his mother. Um, he's writing about how he's going to need money because he needs a new coat. I think he also needs some gloves at the time. And then if you're looking at the screen here over on the right, you'll see a photograph 
of Cadet McDowell, and he fought at the Battle of Newmarket. And you can see a uniform similar to the one there on the screen um, that's actually being worn. So you can also see he's got the um, probably a, a linen or cotton shirt underneath a cravat there up at the top. And um, so, yes, the uniforms that we sometimes see depicted in movies or in other photographs, um, those tend to be more of a dress uniform and probably not what the cadets were wearing at the battle itself. The supply limits of the Confederacy are making changes to the uniforms that are being worn at VMI during the war years. Yeah, so, I mean, they would have had trouble with supplies anyway, like you said, wouldn't they, uh, being where they are. Okay, so we are now going to move on to the battle itself. So the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864 is one part of a big master plan by Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, and that was to disrupt the Confederacy's ability to wage war. So, okay, the battle, May 15th, 1864, the two main commanders. So the Union commander of the Shenandoah, under the command of Major General Franz Siegel. Um, please tell us a little bit about Franz Siegel, please, Sarah. Of course. So Franz Siegel is a German immigrant. He arrives in the United States in 1850, so about 12 years before the Battle of Newmarket. And he had been a revolutionary in the 1848 um, revolutions that were happening in Europe. He uh, kind of ends up on the losing side, but he was established in these revolutionary groups as a military leader. And when a lot of these failed revolutionaries are escaping the European police and uh, traveling to the United States and seeking refuge there and starting communities, Siegel is still acclaimed as a hero among them. And he spends a little bit of time in New York City and then settles in St. Louis where he becomes superintendent of the public schools in that area. He's also very influential with the German American press who will become some of his greatest allies during the Civil War itself. Now, Franz Siegel is Republican, so he supports Lincoln, he supports the Union cause, and he uses his influence to help recruit German Americans to the Union cause. And he fights in the West, then transfers to the East, and by 1864, he's without a command. Um, Lincoln decides to put him back into command at the beginning of the year in hopes of securing the German American vote in the 1864 presidential election. So contrary to some beliefs that I've heard running around out there, the um, Union soldiers that Siegel comes to take command of in March of 1864, they're actually pretty excited at first when he takes command. Um, he does have a glory image, if you will, in the military scene, and there's excitement that he's coming. That starts to fade pretty quick once this army gets on campaign with Siegel. Okay, and Confederate Commander Major General John C. Breckenridge, now very famous guy, before the Civil yes. War. So please tell us about John Breckenridge. Of course. So one of Breckenridge's uh, antebellum claims to fame is that he is the youngest vice president in United States history, and that claim still holds so far up to this day. And Breckenridge is from Kentucky, so uh, one of the border states in the Civil War. He does throw his lot with the Confederacy, partially because his son runs away and joins the Confederacy in 1861. Um, he becomes commander of the Kentucky Orphan Brigade, um, fights at a number of battles in the West. Then he gets into conflict with Braxton Bragg. So that puts him in the category with a lot of other Confederate generals who kind of had conflict with that um, particularly difficult character in the Western theater. And so Breckenridge moves east. He's given command of the Trans-Allegheny Department, which includes the Shenandoah Valley. It's a huge tract of land, and he's told, you get to defend this. And oh, by the way, you just have a few thousand men to defend these hundreds of acres of mountainous and valley region. So is this what leads up to Breckenridge calling up the cadets then, uh, lack of men? Well, a little bit. So Franz Siegel starts his campaign following orders from Grant. 
Um, he finally gets on the march at the very beginning of May, 1864. And at that point, Breckenridge is trying to figure out what's going on. He knows there'll be a Union offensive into his area, but he doesn't know where it's coming from. Um, yes, Breckenridge doesn't have a large army with him. He brings some, a couple of brigades with him from the Virginia Tennessee border. And then he's calling out other military units as he's assembling an army in Stanton, Virginia. So he will reach out to the home guards, um, which are kind of defend the local community type of units, generally either very young men or older guys um, who aren't seeing active campaigning with the Confederate service. Um, and then of course he sends a message to Virginia Military Institute. Now it should be noted that the commanders at VMI had offered to join Breckenridge's army. So the offer was on the table and Breckenridge takes them up on it. He sends a message on May 10th, 1864, and the cadets will join him two days later in Stanton. Okay, okay. so um, the march from VMI, so it's 80 miles, I believe. Is that correct? From Lexington to Newmarket, is that right? Um, what was that like for the uh, young cadets? Right, so it is about 80 miles from Lexington down to Newmarket. Newmarket's um, kind of in the middle of the Shenandoah Valley as you're moving down toward the Potomac River. And they receive orders. The orders come in, in late in the evening of May 10th. The next morning, they are on the road. They cover about 20 miles in the first day and then the, uh, near 20 miles the next day joining Breckenridge's army. So then they've got about 40 miles still to go. Um, before reaching what will be the battlefield of Newmarket. And it's raining. It's a uh, typical spring weather in Virginia, lots of rain, um, which is great for the crops and the beautiful garden flowers. But this is an era where roads are not paved and roads get muddy really quick. One of the cadets who's making the march he actually finds time to write a letter to his mother about halfway through, and he says the roads are perfect lob lolly, which just that very word itself, he, he's like, we're wading through mud, they're perfect lob lolly, it's just terrible. Um, so it was definitely a challenge, and when they would stop to camp, the cadets would try to find shelter if they could. So some of them spend the nights in uh, church which they enter and sleep quietly on the pews or just anywhere to try to get out of the rain. Okay, so the battle. So again, like you just mentioned, so anyway, that was the uh, picture of them marching. I've got to change it. Um, anyway. <laughs> I don't think there's actually any photos of the... No, this, is, this is not actually the march. March. This is uh, one I found of some Confederates marching. But oh, it, okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we'll pretend. Anyway, yes, of um, course. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify for any viewers. Yeah, no, that's it. Yeah, no, there's definitely no pictures of them marching. Otherwise, uh, you know. Um, right. So, um, like you was mentioning, the weather. So, the weather on the morning of the 15th on the battle. So, was it raining on the morning as well? Well, we know that it rains throughout the day. And I believe it was cloudy and overcast most of the time, which also makes it challenging when you are comparing different primary sources and trying to figure out what time of day it is. So I do believe it is cloudy and it does seem to be raining by the afternoon, yes. So that would make, you know, conditions on the battlefield for moving cannons, especially, and obviously, again, troops uh, quite difficult. Yes, you could easily get a cannon stuck in the mud or things like that, which uh, will happen during the course of the battle. There's some cannons up on one of the Union positions called Bashong Hill, and it's described that the cannons were sinking up to their wheel hubs yeah. in the mud. So this is this is a lot of mud. And I was talking with um, some gentlemen who've done some living history reenacting and we were talking about the importance of keeping, if it's raining in a battle situation, you want to keep the rain from falling down your gun barrels. So you might be carrying it with your barrel pointing down, things like that. Um, there's just a whole different set of way fighting unfolds in this war, particularly if it's raining. So those are things interesting to keep in mind when we look at the history as well. Also, um, you know, if it's raining and you're wet, you're going to be miserable. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. And as the cadets, uh, as we'll find out as the story keeps unfolding, you might lose your shoes. 
Yes. So the battle, <laughs> the battle kicks off and everything. So what point is it that the cadets are used for this battle? Right. So when Breckenridge calls the cadets from their school, he intends to use them as reserves, which are, you're not going to put them on the battle line unless you have to. And he holds true to that promise throughout the battle until one point. Now, I do want to point out that the cadets came under fire probably around noon on May 15th, 1864. So as the Confederate Army is advancing in its single line of battle and pushing the Union troops back through several defensive positions, um, the reserves are ordered to follow along, which makes sense because if you're going to need your reserves, you don't want them, excuse me, a mile or two behind your main fighting lines. Pardon me. Um, so the cadets follow, and as they come over the crest of a position called Shirley's Hill, they do come under artillery fire. So they are not actively engaged on the battle line at that point, but they do come under fire as they're marching. Now, the Confederate line continues its advance. The Union sets up its final defensive position, um, which I call the Bashong line. And there's fighting on both sides of these farm fields. And the Confederate line is stretched very thin. And the Confederate officers realize that there is a gap near the Bushong farm. Um, I might be showing up on the map, not quite sure there. Um, and they need to fill the gap in the line because the Union regiments are still charging, still trying to break the Confederate line, of course. So at this point, Breckenridge has two options. Is he gonna put in the inexperienced not military trained um, county reserves or the home guards, or is he gonna put in a trained military force of students, cadets from Virginia Military Institute? And he decides to go with those who have the military training. And it's a difficult decision for Breckenridge. He has a son who is um, very near the ages of many of these cadets. And finally, with no other choice, Breckenridge says, put in the boys and may God forgive me for the order. So at that point, the 257 cadets who are present at the battle are going to be moving into position near, Bashong, um, near the Bashong farm. They'll actually take up position along a rail fence on the north side of the orchard, um, exchange, ex, excuse me, exchange some shots. They'll be there on the battle line. And do you want to jump in with anything? Because I don't want to go to the exciting point if we're not there yet in your list. Um, yeah, anyway, so... This is the Bouchon farm, sorry. Um, yes, yes. Oh, so on the screen here. Oh, this is great. If I can jump in. So yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so this is a, actually a picture I took in 2007 when I was there. This wonderful. one here, and this one is one I found on uh, online. So yeah, please, please jump in on the Bouchon uh, family and farm. Right. So hopefully you're able to see the photos here with us. And I just want to talk about the, uh, well, let's talk about them both. So the one over to the left um, this is looking at the front of the main house, the house that the Bushong family was living in at that time. So you have Jacob and Sarah Bushong, their grandparents. Um, so they're one of their sons and his wife, and then I believe it was three grandchildren. They're actually sheltering in the basement of that house as the battle unfolds. There's windows in the basement, so they must have seen people running past as the battle unfolds around them, but they shelter there. So the photo to the left there with the front of the house, this kind of gives us an idea of what the cadets might have seen. Of course, you got a picture of a rainy day, not the brilliant sunny day that this was taken on. Um, and they're actually, their units are gonna split to go around the house and other outbuildings um, with two companies going left and two companies going right. And then, so that's kind of where they're gonna make that split if you can kind of picture it, or you know, this is what they could have been seen. And then as we look at this other photo, which is the one to the right, this is taken from the opposite side. So it's like we've jumped over the house and turned around to kind of look at its back. Um, and you'll see the oven, um, the outdoor oven there. And then the, I believe it's the 1828 house, um, which the Bashongs had lived in prior to building their large house. So this is gonna be, um, closer to the fence heading into the orchard where the units are gonna start coming back together. Um, probably a few of the cadets are wounded in that area in the back of, near that back of the house photo. Um, at least according to what I've read, that's a conclusion that I've come to. 
and obviously the famous field of lost shoes. Now, this is a picture I took as well. For some reason, I managed to get the portal losing. I don't know how I managed that. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I think from where I was standing, I think this was the other side. So the house was behind me. And that looks I, about right. Yeah. So I think the field goes up that way. If you know what I mean from the fence. So is this the fence line you may be talking about? Maybe. I think it might be. Um, not an, not exactly sure which position we're taking this from on the field, but um, let's go with it. There's a there's a split rail fence on the north side of the orchard. And as we previously mentioned, the cadets come into battle line there. Um, they're firing, the battle's continuing. And it's from this point where the cadets will make a decisive charge across the open field, which is so beautifully pictured um, in the photograph there on the left, which is taken from the Union position on Bashong Hill, looking down toward the farm and where the cadets were. So the cadets are part of an overall advance of the Confederate line, which seems to be happening relatively all at once, but without a general order. It's kind of unique how things unfold in this battle. A rainy situation, lots of smoke, lots of confusion going on. Um, the cadets realize if we stay here, we're probably going to get killed. But if we can get up and capture these artillery pieces, um, as other Confederate units are also making an, an advance, perhaps we'll be able to live and fight another day. So they're actually going to charge across that open field, which again is pictured there on the left. And they do capture a cannon from Von Kiesler's battery and um, force him to also remove his four other guns, which he still had at the time. Okay. Um, I need to ask about um, a little story about these guys. So um, Thomas sure. Garland Jefferson and Moses Jacob Ezekiel. Now, um, obviously, this is um, Jefferson, I believe, I think. Yes. And the other two, obviously, this is the young uh, Ezekiel, Jacob yeah. Ezekiel, and this is the older guy. Obviously, he becomes a sculptor, doesn't he, in the end? And actually, uh, from what I understand, he actually commissions or puts his sculpture in VMI. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Yeah, so, so please tell us their story because um, it's quite sad, actually, isn't it? Yes, it is. And the capture of the cannon, the charge across the field, um, is a glory moment, but at the same time, these cadets are realizing that war is not glory because after that charge happens and Breckenridge pulls them out of the battle, um, he doesn't let them continue um, in the pursuit of the Union retreat. The cadets are faced with the reality of going back across these fields that they've battled over and they're finding wounded and dead comrades. These other young men that they've been at school with um, that they've now fought alongside in an actual battle situation, um, they're finding them. And this is a very difficult, um, some might even use the word traumatic moment for them. So the cadets that you've mentioned, Thomas Garland Jefferson, who is a descendant of the American founding father, Thomas Jefferson, um, he and Moses Ezekiel are roommates. Um, in when they were still at VMI in the barracks. And Moses Ezekiel finds Thomas and he's badly wounded in the chest. And he's able to get him moved to a house in town. It's the uh, Kleindienst house. And there are some civilian women help Moses Ezekiel and several other cadets um, to take care of Jefferson. He does receive medical attention from the surgeon who's accompanied the Corps of Cadets, um, but Jefferson passes away and Ezekiel is there with him. And it's a very moving, very life-changing moment for Ezekiel. Um, he doesn't forget it. He writes about it um, in his old age and Ezekiel survives the war. He goes on, he studies art both here in the United States and then goes to Europe um, where he will actually be knighted by the King of Italy um, in recognition of some of the work that he does. Um, very famous sculptor and one of the pieces that he specifically does um, kind of from his heart, if you will, if that's a permissible phrase, is the statue that is located here on the right of the screen and it's called Virginia Mourning Her Dead and it stands on the Virginia Military Institute campus and just behind it are the graves 
or, or and, and grave markers of the cadets who fell in the Battle of Newmarket. And it's this memorial tribute that Ezekiel gives back to his um, military school because he wants them to remember the bravery and the loss um, that occurs at the Battle of Newmarket. Mm -hmm. And this is a, uh, a reincurring thing with all wars is young men think this is going to be fun and exciting, isn't it? You know, and it's just not. When they actually get there, it's not. It's sad. OK. So what are we talking about casualty wise for uh, VMI then? So out of that 250 guys, um, how many actually uh, died? Right. So 10 cadets die as a result of the battle and the new market campaign. So that's going to be Cadets Atwell, Cable, Crockett, Hartsfield, Haynes, Jefferson, Jenner, McDowell, Stannard, and Wheelwright. And then there's about 50 who are reported as being wounded. Seems like there were probably a few more who didn't go and get in the surgeon's count, but they'll say later on that, yes, they were hit. It just wasn't serious enough to need medical attention at a field hospital. They were busy helping others. Yeah. And I'm gonna jump back again, because I did miss something out. So why is it called the Field of Lost Shoes? Ah, uh, yes. So the large open field that the cadets charge across, um, it slopes drastically and it kind of makes this basin area. And with all the rain that had been happening in the week up to, and then the day of the battle, it's, um, a really big mud puddle. I have been out there and seen it after several days of rain and it, it's pretty swampy. So what happens as the cadets run across this area, the mud is so deep that it's pulling the shoes from their feet and they run on barefoot at that point. But after they're pulled out of the battle, um, as they're going back across the field, there are some accounts of cadets stopping and like rummaging around in the mud and their comrades are like, what are you doing? And they're like, I'm finding my shoes yeah. or others were looking for food because at this point, you know, it's midday and they're hungry. So um, field of lost shoes. And that has become uh, very much associated with the Battle of Newmarket. There's a documentary that was produced by that title, I believe in the 1990s. And then more recently, a movie that's been done. I think it was released in 2014. And it has that phrase, field of lost shoes, has come to symbolize a lot, um, both the location on the battlefield and then also so much of what was won and lost, as we've been talking about, for the Corps of Cadets at that battle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this guy, um, we've got George Randall Collins, and he um, bought the Bouchon farm um, at some point. Um, please tell us the story behind this. Yes, of course. So George Randall Collins attends Virginia Military Institute. He's in the class of 1911. Um, he serves in the U.S. military in World War I, goes on and becomes a highly successful businessman. And he knows the story of what happened at Newmarket. And he takes a really important step for battlefield preservation for this piece of ground. So in 1944, Collins is able to purchase um, what amounts to 129 acres of the core battlefield area, which includes the Bashong Farm and the Field of Lost Shoes. Um, later on, other preservation efforts um, are taken, and it's now 171 acres that is held in the State Historical Park. And there's been some other preservation by other groups out to the side. Um, now, in 1964, so 100 years after the Battle of Newmarket, George Collins dies. And when his will is read, it's discovered that he has deeded this property at Newmarket that he purchased to Virginia Military Institute to be used as a perpetual memorial for the battle that happened there and also for educational purposes. And he is well remembered at the battlefield site for this important preservation that he did. Um, the drive that leads to the museum and the main part of the battlefield is George Collins Memorial Parkway. And um, he did a lot to ensure that the battleground can be explored and seen as a place to remember. 
and it is still um, administered. This part of the battlefield is still under the jurisdiction of Virginia Military Institute. They still bring cadets there for um, history lessons, for tours, and in normal times, not COVID times, um, there are different ceremonies that happen at different points in the cadet years at Newmarket Battlefield. Uh-huh. And uh, do you, did um, so when did the uh, highway actually go in part through the, through the battlefield? Because that must have been a lot. There must have been a lot of people opposed to that. Right. Um, I do not know a date off the top uh, of my head. Sorry, I'm sorry I was about that. Purple there, didn't I? It just it was just when I was watching your video the other day. I, I mean, I don't remember it being that close to the battlefield, but of course it is, you know. And I mean, right. there must so, be a lot of people against that, you know. Right. So Highway 81, it's Interstate 81, um, which runs through the Shenandoah Valley. It literally cuts right through um, Newmarket Battlefield. And they were, my understanding is they were able to get it shifted a little bit. Um, so it didn't encroach as badly as the original road planners wanted it to. Um, but it, it is rather challenging and disruptive. On the positive side, um, there is land preserved on both sides. And for the area that is held by the State Historical Park, you can pass under the highway in a tunnel to get from what would be where the side where the Bushong House is and then over to where um, the Pennsylvania Monument and some other historic sites are. But it does present challenges for interpretation. I know I stood on Shirley's Hill and tried to... It upsets to... me, actually. When I saw your videos that you did um, on YouTube, they upset me a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. it does show the importance, and it's, it's a good reminder of the need for preservation. Yep. Yep. And sometimes progress is going to happen, and... You're going to have to make some compromise, which is, okay, you're not right on top of the Bushong house. You moved it over just a little bit. Um, but it does illustrate the importance of preservation and educating those in the history community and others in the area where these sites are about, you know, the importance of it. And fortunately, um, the highway is there. And, well, that didn't quite phrase right. <laughs> the highway is there. But fortunately, there have been some other preservation efforts in the area, um, which are increasing the amount of land preserved around Newmarket Battlefield. Um, so that is a positive. Mm -hmm. And Shenandoah Valley Battlefield's foundation is helping to spearhead some of those efforts. OK, cool. OK, let's move on to the important one. So your book, what an amazing book. So people, come on, go and buy this book because it's amazing. Anyway, so your book, Call Out the Cadets. Um, so tell me about the opportunity, how it came up for a start. Obviously, I know you're part of the Emerging Civil War, which is amazing as well. But yep. why in particular the Battle of Newmarket? What was it that caught your attention and you thought, you know what, I want to write a book about this? Right. So I first set foot on Newmarket Battlefield on a very hot August day in 2016. And I went through the museum and then... I didn't live in the state of Virginia at the time. So when I would get to go to Virginia, it didn't matter what the weather was. I went out and walked battlefields. So it was incredibly warm, but because of that, I had the battlefield to myself. And I had just been taking in all this information pretty much for the first time. I hadn't really done a lot of reading on the battle or anything like that. And exploring the battlefield was very moving. And I actually had a brother who had joined the military earlier in that year. And he was the same age as some of these cadets who fought there. And um, I think there was a little bit of a connection there between present and past um, that greatly intrigued me. And the story of courage um, that these young men displayed as a military unit from a military school, which is incredibly unique. Um, yes, there's lots of young men who fight in the Civil War, so, you know, many the same ages as these cadets, but here you have a group of young men who've lived together, who've trained together, who've studied together, and they're put into war in an incredibly unique situation um, for the American Civil War. And so there was something about that that really gripped me. And 
at the same time, Chris Mikowski, who's the editor in chief of Emerging Civil War, was gently pestering me to do a book. And I wasn't sure what to do because I didn't live in state and I didn't know how I was going to write about a battlefield from all the way across on the other side of the country. Um, but New Market really captured my mind. And it is an important battle, but it's a relatively small battle and it's relatively easy to understand and explain. And so I thought, you know, I think I could come back to New Market and spend a week or so and really understand the land and be able to piece together things that happened. Um, obviously, I did much more research than just a week, but the week is like the part of boots on the ground, being able to do research that way. Um, so I felt like it was something that I could research long distance, successfully understand when I could come back and study on the fields. And it was a really amazing project. And I've it's been an honor to... Um, get to research the accounts and write a book that hopefully introduces visitors and history buffs to the battlefield. Yeah, because that's what I like about emergency Civil war books as well, because they're obviously I listen to it in on audio, but if you get the book, they're like guides as well. So they, they will tell you where important things are and you know, they're, they're, they're good. Um, so again, emergency Civil war though. So if you was living across the other side of the country, how did you uh, manage to get your job um, working with Emerging Civil War in the first place? Right. So Emerging Civil War is volunteer. And I had been, I was blogging in other areas and I followed them on WordPress and just really loved the content that they were putting out. And a friend was encouraging me to start guest blogging. And so I went through different blogs that I read and I thought, oh, wow, I would, it would be so exciting to have a post published on emerging civil war. This was back in 2015. And so I submitted a piece and oh my goodness, here's a big secret. They sent it back like three or four times. I had to keep writing this piece, but it finally- Mikowski that sent it back. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it did appear on May 8th of 2015. And I read it now and I'm like, oh man, it needed a few more revisions. <laughs> but that was where it started. And they asked if I would write a few more pieces as a guest author. And I followed up with that. And then um, I believe it was December, 2015 that um, they voted me in as a member. And then uh, for better or worse, I just kept volunteering to help with things and you know, worked on the editorial board for a little while and then became co-managing editor. And then when my editing partner went on to some amazing new job opportunities, I ended up being managing editor. So right. it's a great team. If you're interested in guest posting, um, you know, anyone listening here, just feel free to check out the guidelines on the website. We're always excited to work with new emerging voices in the civil it, war field. It's amazing. It is amazing what those guys put together, you know, it is, you know, and you Absolutely. work so hard, you know, you do work hard. And there's so many good books out there, guys. Honestly, they're putting out some stuff. They're putting out stuff that we want to, you know, that you've always wanted to read about, you know. That's the thing as well. Um, so, yeah, okay. So, um, anyway, if you would like to know more about the Battle of New Market, obviously, you didn't, we didn't go into real deep details, you know, because we want you to go and listen to the book or read the book. So, as well, you know, so it is available and I will leave all relevant links to the book and emerging civil war in the description below. So Sarah, can I just say, thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me to join Re you. Really enjoyable, you're great to talk to, and I really enjoyed it, and thank you very much. Thank you.